And welcome to Stone Soup Poetry tonight. I am very excited for tonight's feature. I'm very excited for the features that are going to be coming in for the next few weeks. We've got some uh, great people lined up. We got some. We have a great person tonight, and the Stone Soup uh, Poetry roster feature roster is going to be slowly, be, but surely, being filled. Hmm. Seems like I'm echoing. Let me see if I can fix that. Hmm. Am I less echoey? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure what happened there because I'm all muted from everyone. But anyway, I'm going to mute a couple more people because there could be feedback from other people's mics that has happened before. Funny story. But at any rate, uh, tonight's feature is John Mulrooney, a person who I've known for very many years. And I am uh, so thrilled to have him here. He's someone who I've asked to feature in the past, but geography, time, and different dates. Uh, mainly Stone Soup was always coming on a date when he couldn't do it because he was had a prior engagement. And I always wanted to get him on here. So if there's going to be uh, one labeled one positive thing about the pandemic, AKA the greatest collective mass murder in history, <laughs> we, it is the fact that I can get people who I haven't never had before or people I've always wanted to have or both uh, on, on the feature to share your work with us and have an archive of it. And that is one gift I'm going to be taking care uh, taking advantage of for a very long time. Um, just a quick reminder for next week, we have uh, Jason Wright, who's going to be featuring on the 24th. He has a new book out called Train of Thought. Jason Wright, many of you know from Oddball Magazine, a uh, journal I highly recommend you submit to. It's one I'm part of uh, the editorial process on and part of the Oddball Foundation, so it's grown a lot. And then on the 31st, we have a well, uh, guest open micer tonight is going to be going to the center stage on the 31st of March, Colleen Houlihan. If you've never seen her work before, you're going to be in for a treat. For those of you who have seen her work and heard her work and seen it published in a number of local publications, you're going to, um, you, know that you know that you're not going to want to miss that night. I've been loaded Jacques already, Colleen. Hopefully he will read an email for once and he will be there as well. I am uh, excited and I'm also excited for John Rush, uh, editor of the Joe Poems, uh, the, the further adventures of Joe, the, uh, I think it's the continuing adventures of Joe the Poet and then the further adventures of Joe the Poet. So we are excited to have him. And he's also a number of, been a part of uh, numerous other projects, including a five-part anthology in reaction to the last four years of hell that we've had. He's always working, always doing great stuff, and he's a perfect introduction to National Poetry Month. I'm looking forward to that a lot. So without further ado, we're gonna to get to the open mic. For, again, for those of you who are on the call uh, for the first time, for the first time in a while, I'm not gonna have certain individuals, I'm not gonna be putting people like Rachel and Mark uh, on the mic if uh, they've never done this before, but if you want to go on the mic, just text me privately and uh, let me know that you want to do this. And if you're on the phone, Margaret, is that you who just came in? It is, if you can hear me, Chad, yes, hello. Excellent, excellent. I'm gonna have to mute you uh, just for the sake of- Great. Uh, but I want to know if you wanted to uh, be part of the reading or if you're just listening. Sure, I'll try to read something. I just rummaged out now. If I can read it, my Not writing, I mean, sure. Not a problem. I'll call on you. Thanks a lot. Okay. And with that, let's get to the first person who's one of the first people I saw on tonight. Um, he has been a past uh, feature as part of the online incarnation of Stone Soup. And it's been fantastic to hear him uh, perform his work at length and get published at length. He has books available online and including a new book, a mystery book on novel on Kindle. Let's welcome up John Wessick. Thank you, Chad. Uh, here are two poems about Ireland. This is called A Nation of Best Buds. In Ireland, you can talk theater with strangers, something that would get you only fish stares in the US. People are easy to approach. The guy with James Joyce spectacles, woman exiting the mock motel room in the gallery, the Nigerian law student, Italian expat, Scottish medievalist girl in rainbow skirt, and bicyclist who pulled over to discuss Ballyturk. You can talk about anything 
Irish don't know how to cook with saffron, the Iranian barber says while snipping around my ears. The best does not come from Spain, no, from Afghanistan. One selfish politician shut down the Garth Brooks show. 80,000 people were going to fly in. The taxi driver pulls over and opens the trunk. Know what this is? He shows me his curling stick. Ever been to Burning Man? A guy rubs the pink skin of his shaved head. I'm going back this summer. Love the food in America. Sure, we've got curry, but Irish cooks aren't as creative. Saffron, I say. Learn to cook with saffron. And this is, I attend a poetry reading in Western Ireland. The empty seats up front occupied by ghosts from the potato famine. Next row, martyrs from the Easter uprising, war of independence, civil war and Northern Ireland troubles. No place for me to sit. So next to Maud gone, I stand in back, dropping and retrieving. Umbrella jacket. Thank you. I wonder where uh, the radio music was coming from. Could have been from the live feed as well, which I'm muting right now. But now, oh, hi, Patricia. I'll get you out to the open mic. And now, up next, I'm always glad to have her on. Uh, I've been missing you for a while. Let's bring back up Mary Jennings. Thank you, Chad. Glad to be back. Um, I'm just going to read uh, three um, synquains, uh, three moot point synquains. Mercy is a moot point. Malignancy prospers as the benign is crucified. Justice? Justice is a moot point. Deep pockets are a must if you value freedom from blame. Scott free. Freedom is a moot point. You are only as free as the dogma you embrace allows. Thank you. I said I wasn't muted. Thank you, Mary. And now up next, who do we have up next? Ah, yes, this uh, person is one half of the editorial team behind the uh, tiny lit mag known as Molecule. Molecule just came out with its uh, fourth, I believe it's fourth issue, two years running now. Uh, she produced, she helps edit it along with Kevin Carey and there's a lot of work on there by local poets and beyond an interview um, conducted by Clay Ventra, um, a uh, added poetry by me and Timothy Gager. Uh, you should check it out and you can download it for free this week. Uh, there are links on the Stone Soup because I, on the Stone Soup uh, Facebook page and elsewhere. And let's ask to unmute, let's ask her to unmute. MP Carver. Hey, Chad. Thanks. Good to see you. you um, yes, I, I and actually I'll put that uh, the link to the magazine in chat. Um, and then uh, I had one other um, uh, announcement, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. I just wanted to let everybody know that um, for the Mass Poetry Festival this year, uh, we are, we've got three open contest calls. Um, uh, if anybody's interested, we're looking for um, a poem from the community to open the festival. Um, we're looking for nominees for a, like a fun award ceremony. And um, we've also got an ekphrastic gallery contest. Uh, everything it's free to enter. Um, entries are limited to uh, you know one per person, but please, I hope everybody will think about sending stuff. I, I just put the link in chat, and I'll put the link to Molecule um, as well if anybody wants to download that. Um, a festival this year is going to be May thirteenth to sixteenth, and I think registration is going. Registration should open uh, <laughs> uh, next week, hopefully, definitely by the end of the month. So. Um, all right, and uh, thanks, uh, thanks for bearing with me. Um, I'm just going to read uh, one poem, a translation. Um, and this is a Japanese poem from the 10th century. 
um, by a Prince Motoyoshi. Um, it, I will read the Japanese and then I'll read my translation. Wabi nureba, ima hato onaji, nani wa naru, mi o sukushite mo, awan tozo mo. And then uh, the translation. Lovelorn and stagnant in Naniwa Bay, even the channel buoys remind me how I yearn to meet you again. Thanks. Thank you very much, MP. Who do we have next? Ah, yes. We have, we have, we are joined by uh, three people via the phone. And one of which is uh, one of which I help join date regularly. She's been a staple of the Snow Soup online scene, though lacking a computer, she's able to join by phone and has since last year when we celebrated our 49th anniversary. And I am uh, glad, I'm glad and very thankful she's on the open mic. So I'm going to unmute her and we're going to welcome up the great Carol Weston. You're up, Carol. Oh, wow. Okay. No, right. So, um, I was, uh, I was at Bennington College, thank God, and I lasted a year and a quarter anyway. And, um, and they were talking about art at dinner and I barely survived the discussion and out of it came, <clears throat> what is art? They have an art who crack their heels, tap happy on the floor, who stack their trills in tails of blues and gargle rooster call cuckoos. They have an art. They have an art who spill the paint in painful spite, designed or not, it is all right. Expression from depression speaks regardless if it booms or squeaks, it still is art. Art only rooms in untopped balloons and inserts itself in undoubting undoubt booms. The times decide if it will pass as rooted in the artist class. If spilling salt helps one exalt, then have a heart. That, too, is art. And my French teacher, the remarkable uh, Herbert Myron, who wouldn't teach any... Uh, uh, poetry unless he knew the poets, um, said, I sent your poem to my friend Sam Beckett. <laughs> I didn't know who that was at the time. Okay. Thank you. I love you, Carol. Thanks so much. No matter who breaks the ice, Carol's always there to crush the ice a little bit more. And up next, a recent birthday poet, recent uh, a past participant in many uh, Stone Soup related events as an open micer. Uh, the, as part of the, he was part of the Boston Poetry Marathon. Let's welcome up Clay Ventra. Hey, Chad, what's up? How you doing? Hey, you know. <laughs> well said. All right, this is called. Um, no one ever died. No one ever died at the plastic banana factory, not even once. It's true, you can check it. And no one ever will, it's scientific. But someday somebody will die near the France-Switzerland border, near Geneva, from some stray subatomic particle or a smashed and broken heart. And all the good luck receding and unmeasurable. Like when the sun exploded, when we all had about eight minutes and all the traffic cops uncrossed their arms and stopped looking the same. And all the insects laughed their tiny insect laughs and strippers found modesty and some priests thought God would be a good idea, but God was indecisive, stuck in the old book of La Brea. And words were like grappling hooks in everyone's throats and the sick sighed and the mad came out of the trees one last time and were backed off the edge of the world floating to the sound of applause, old and infirm and full of stars. Thanks. Thank you very much, Clay. Clay and MP are using uh, 
are using are using graphics to in their plays because I think that all the poets from the North Shore think they lose their soul anytime they're photographed. But um, it is more important that we hear their voice. So thank you, Clay. Thank you, MP. Check out Molecule and uh, check out Clay's interview, which is pretty clever given the format of the magazine, which is everything is very uh, sparsely written poetry, prose, and uh, even one act plays. Or are they half act plays? Anyway, let's go now to, let's go now to, uh, as, as they say at Monty Python, and now for something completely different, it's Bill. Why do I get this? Heavens to Murgatroyd, I am one of the kindest, gentlest, most thoughtful individuals here. Who in the world? Oh, and I take this abuse constantly. I do not understand what Chad's issue is, but <clears throat> well, there's nothing I can do about Chad. <clears throat> Colleen was not here at the end of my glorious explorations of um, uh, gender identity. That is what it is, gender identity. Um, gender identity in this case happened to involve uh, small underwear, but in any case, um, so I actually did a movie for the, um, what were they called? The Do-It-Yourself Pornography Movie Festival. And so no nudity, no dirty words, uh, but everybody was like, ah, and it was really fun. And they gave me a standing ovation. This was at the uh, theater. So I wanted to share that with you. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. But my addition, my, my contribution will be of a different nature. This is, I thought that this was the best poem that I had, my happiest poem in a long time. It is, um, do I have it here? Ah, whatever. It is a love poem to uh, a young lady um, who I was, uh, uh, Deeply involved with, I suppose you would say. Um, there, there she is. There, there we. Uh, that's a terrible picture. I got a better picture. Wait, let's see the other picture. That should be better. There we are. There, there. That is the gorgeous young lady, to which I dedicate <clears throat> the following poem, which is most appropriately entitled "She Hates Me." <clears throat> I'm not her daddy. She knows that fact well. I'm her mom's funny old friends, and well, that's just as well. Her brother and sister, who are several years younger, they want a daddy. It's for him that they hunger. Just an old friend, but I'm fun and I play. We do neat things together whenever I stay. It's like you're our daddy, Caden whispered in my ear. As he rode on my shoulders, big and brave with no fear. And Bibi awakens me from my slumbers on their couch by counting my fingers one through 10. She's no slouch. Daddy, she purrs. When her mom is away, it makes me so happy she likes me that way. But Ashley is eight and she is no fool. She knew who her real father, she knew he was cruel. I'm okay as a friend. I bring water balloons, but don't get too close. Don't try too soon. I'm just your mom's friend, though I am fairly silly. There are a few things as fun as tricking poor Billy. As we drove the lake, she gave all the commands, so we ate at McDonald's to fulfill her demands. At the lake, the kids, they all splashed and played and found her to be a most wonderful day. Now, Ashley is clever, and it's a fair bet that when I'm distracted, she'll get me all wet. 
She'll knock off my, all my s'mores off into the fire and driving me crazy. I fear she'll not tire. And trumping my cards and stealing my spoons, this obnoxious child makes me look like a goon. At two in the morning, it's vacation, no curfew. The little ones slump as if on the same cue. But Ashley is big and she wants to know what we adults say when our children are near. Now, Ash is a kid who never asks for permission. Let's get out of her way and she's on a mission. Like a pup who's searching for the most comfortable ground, she crawls onto my lap and turns herself around. And having found it, that most perfect place, she wraps my arms around her and nods off into space. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. So we've gone from the humorous to the solemn to the surreal, back to uh, back to the silly again, or the or the whimsical, I should say. And now we have our first sneak preview for two weeks from now. This is a great surprise for me. I wasn't sure she was coming on. And let us welcome up uh, the poet who the poet who will be your feature on uh, March 31st. And if my awkward hyping wasn't enough to convince you, hopefully this will convince you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome up Colleen Houlihan. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. All right, this one is called Inside the Valley of Brokeback. And it was inspired by the movie Brokeback Mountain, which I loved and found, you know, full of longing and passion. Ooh, he's whistling. Before the wind speaks in tongue of solitary wolf, moving over then inside the gulf, wide swath of land bordered by cypress, where a man can be silent, left to breathe as the gale howls for him. What thoughts except his hand, wrist, and slow whirl of fingers, cigarette illuming only a fraction of his face. We do not think of passion, easier to imagine the plan of God, yet something stirs eloquent and elegant in the face of unwashed skin. This body that rides horses seven hours a day, the other time walking over hillocks, little mountains that one day could rise. Is this before or after? Funny how it all could be the same. This stillness inside it, my mouth always silent, though fingers betray. A gun at my side, but not every time the desire to kill the wolf when it answers. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Colleen. And as I keep on saying, there's more where that came from. Join us in two weeks for a wonderful feature. Jim, if you can, uh, put in the comments as to uh, whether or not you want to uh, read a poem tonight in the open mic. For now, we will go to our next participant. Let's see if she, hopefully she didn't lose herself. Um, let's go to Jan Rowe. Jan, are you there? Uh, you need to unmute yourself. There you go. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay, this is um, expository as usual. This is something <laughs> I wrote today. Tax cuts for the well-off. Woohoo! 21 state attorney generals, repugnance want to take money in the rescue plan, money to prevent layoffs of police, firefighters, frontline workers. Want to give that money tax cuts. But in the state must, the states must balance their uh, budgets. Bye-bye pensions, not the feds. And despite the last minute addition to this package to prevent the money to be used for to cut taxes, enough tax cuts already. 
And if these 21 state attorney generals, these repugnants, these Republicans, excuse me, if they can't take the, the workers' money and do what they want, then they're going to go to the Supremes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. And now, it gives me great pleasure to bring up our little musical interlude. If uh, you're lucky, you've heard him on Stone Soup before. If you're lucky, you've seen him on YouTube clips or just all around Boston. He's uh, done music for Stone Soup for as long as I can remember now, mostly because my memory isn't good. I called him the uh, pulse of Stone Soup at one point, but he's almost the pulse of Boston because he's performed for so many people besides Stone Soup. Let's welcome up Ethan Mackler. Thank you. I'm not muted. All right. I'd like to do a piece. This is by John Cooper Clark. John Cooper Clark. That's his name. Um, it's a piece entitled Things Are Gonna Get Worse. What me worry I should care, shit for brains, wire for hair. I've seen the future and I ain't there. Things are gonna get worse. Velcro slippers in a spandex waistband, washed up on planet wasteland, zipped up like a nylon spaceman. Things are gonna get worse. Things are going to get worse, nurse. Things are going to get rotten. Make that hearse reverse, nurse. I'm trying to remember all that I've forgotten. A menace in the box. I was good in the air. Now I can't get up from the easy chair. The doctor told me, oh, yeah, things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse, nurse. Things are going to get crappy. Color me perverse, nurse. Bad news always makes me happy. The money's gone. There's just the muck. Social services pass the buck. How bad does it have to suck? Things are going to get worse. All that's left is a taste of soup. Afternoon reruns of F Troop and a painful frame with a built-in stoop. Things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse, nurse. I ain't optimistic. I've got a mouse like a purse, nurse, and my bungalow smells of piss and biscuits. Life's a bitch, a bit rich. Double up with a permanent stitch. Any kind of effort would be so last ditch. Things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse, nurse. Murder by statistics. Take me back to the first verse. The last one's just too pessimistic. Euthanasia, that sounds good. An alpine neutral neighborhood. Then back to Britain, dressed in wood. Things are going to get worse. Thank you very much, Ethan. Moving on to the open mic, because we have a few more to go, but then we have an amazing feature, Deserve Your Time. He's listened to all of you. I want you to listen to him. But first, let's uh, get to the last bits of the open mic we have. Let's go to the head of the, uh, the mastermind of the Brownstone Poets in New York, Patricia Kerrigan. I didn't know what was coming on this soon. OK. This soon, we've had like 20 people already. <laughs> Blue Moon, inspired by Ella Fitzgerald. Mom used to say, the wheel of fortune would spin for some and not for others. That good things might come once in a blue moon. Luck differs from person to person and blue moons happen every two to three years. A blue moon saw me stand alone under radiance of fool's gold, being about 238,855 miles away. How can it see what's going on? How hear thoughts pound head and heart? Blue moons are full moons, harbingers for problems, life's lunacies and systemic stress. Their names born from Bilu, Old English for betrayal. I'm not into cliched romance or a satellite idol with a Swiss cheese exterior. When the earth has been arrested by its own inhabitants and justice 
has left the building. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Let's bring us now to Miss Nancy Dodson, who needs to unmute herself because she's on the phone. There she is. Isolation. Quiet, quiet controls my mind. Then comes inner peace of God in prayer. Calm, calm my feelings. Steady, steady my thoughts giving deep, abiding peace. The mind grows in strength with retirement, reflection, and books. Solitude might fight the lack of conversation and friendship when one lives alone and only has the phone for friendship. Farewell to solitude happens when one encounters the joy of intercourse with vaccine. COVID illness becomes lost. And we rejoice in the fellowship of mankind, leading to peace and calm mentally within. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Nancy. And our last per our next to last person is the last person on the uh, phone list for tonight. Um, she we knew her back in the day of, or at least I knew her back in the day of the. Um, early Audis in 2005. She was at Jack's side pretty constantly helping her, helping him out and helping arrange his poetry, his work, um, to which we owe a great debt of gratitude for that. And even though she, it's hard for her to get to the soup anymore, it's great that we have this option of the phone, of the remote, which is why I'm gonna be trying to keep this going even after the plague eventually, hopefully, please let it Pass by, pass, passes by. Um, I'm going to ask her to unmute by pressing star six. And let's welcome up Margaret and Wessel. Margaret, if you're there, you can press star, star six and unmute yourself. Hmm. Okay, well, we will see what's going on here uh, later. We will, um, uh, for now, I will go to um, the next person up. Let's go to, trying to see where he is. You can check out his photography today at oddballmagazine.com. He helps make that, that website uh, look good. It's oddballmagazine.com. Please consider uh, sharing your work with us. We're publishing more and more new people each and every day as the political climate continues to intensify in spite of you know who being gone. Um, I'm also looking for, uh, we are also looking for uh, poems and responses to the horrific shooting of last, uh, of last night in Georgia. And if, you, we, and if you can pass that along to Asian Voices, because we would definitely like them represented, and I do have other people I can contact, but I'm uh, taking away the thunder for the man who I call Gentleman Galt, and I call him Gentleman because he lets me do that. I don't deserve his praise or his work, but He's here nonetheless. So thank you, Ed. And let's hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. This one tonight is somewhat reminiscent of Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground. Same kind of a character, same kind of a voice, but different, kind of updated and more, a little bit more contemporary. And um, anyway, uh, Dostoevsky's narrator was a civil servant. Mine is a uh, kind of a museum curator type. It's called Confessions of a Stairwell Man. One reason you don't remember me is because, generally speaking, I am not the kind of guy, hmm, I am not the kind of guy that most people generally recall or even see in the first place. People tell me sometimes that they thought I was a statue which is perfectly understandable since I stand very quietly uh, and allow them to look at paintings and other exhibits. Of course, I am there to answer questions, but most prefer to stand and read the panels as they progress, as they progress along the rail. 
When they are ready to ascend the steps, I tell them that it is a one-way stairwell, and that they will be going down another way, back into the courtyard, which is where they started from. If they wish to see the first floor a second time, then they are well, then they were welcome to re-enter through the way in which they first came. It is only because the stairwell is so narrow that this is necessary. If we were to allow people to go down as well as up, the passage would be terribly congested. So for safety and convenience, we have people go down and then around the way they came. It would be, of course, easier if the staff person upstairs would simply tell people to not go back down the stairwell, but this isn't always possible. And people would sometimes resent being told that they couldn't go back down once they were already up. Um, also, it's easier for the staff upstairs to get people to cooperate if they were told about the stairwell before. Once upstairs, people agree quickly because they don't want to be told again. In fact, they didn't want to be told the first time. I do say it a lot to everyone who goes up. Um, then there are the usual things they, that have to be brought up. Photography, eating, drinking, and more recently, the cell phone. You would think this would not need to be mentioned, but people seem to have a need to always be on the phone, in restaurants, in church, in traffic, crossing the street while the traffic is still going, while still on the john. So they wouldn't think twice about it in the museum. When I bring it up, they look at me as if I've committed a cardinal act of blasphemy, or perhaps I am some pagan persecutor of their religion. They believe that I am dead from the neck up. The only thing really saving me from that is being a poet. Um, yes. When nobody is in the room in which I am stationed, I stand leaning on the rail. I sit or I sit on a stool leaning up against the wall and I write. In the winter, I get a lot of this done. In the winter, I get a lot done this way. In the early spring, when the visitation begins to pick up, I will get the stool out, only to have someone come in. When I get off work, I will go to a cafe for coffee and to go over what I have written, often on very small pieces of paper with a pencil it will be something I will read next week. Tonight, I will be reading one I, which I wrote last week about a man who stands by the entrance of a stairwell and tells people over and over again that they will be going up a one-way stairwell. Thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Gold. Oh, well. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And now we go to the closing person on the open mic. Uh, he's usually the, he's usually our penultimate closer for the open mic, and he's mostly because he's been well, not most, not be not mostly, but partly because he is the uh, he's one of the longest goers to Stone Soup since its incarnation back in 1971. The uh, May the May anniversary for Stone Soup's 50th is coming up. I hope you can be a part of it, as I hope all of you can be a part of it. This person not only uh, does the Stone Soup open mic, he writes endlessly, and uh, we put that writing to good use in a column called It's All One Thing, which is every Wednesday morning. It's published at oddballmagazine.com. And without any further ado, let's bring up Mr. Van Loy. Thanks, Chad. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So this is a poem called Over Here, Over There. Every time I find myself in London, 
and end up tasting the dust of my ancestors in the ruin of a World War II bombing raid, Christ Church, found on our first grand tour when I only knew of Christ Church in Virginia. I always go to the British Library and then to the left-wing bookstore by King's Cross, Houseman's, where invariably I, I find exactly what I need to read to finally understand history is now and past is but prelude as everywhere I go, the corporate TV envelope drops into the trash national garble of guitars playing on whatever commons are still left. And everyone is trying to figure out exactly where are we going, rolling, rolling along the swift blue Rhine and the Alps, leaping off ledges, waterfall down the cliffs in each valley with its own rushing stream and we've finally seen all the faces and blooms of spring repeated from Scottish border to Adriatic coast. We look up to discover the foothills advancing under spring storms to the heavily dusted snowy peaks of Grand Sasso. Over us, this great white pureness fallen upon us in the one night where we will finally see the present stars and relax ourselves and do everything we just learned. And let me sing a quick song. We're not the good guys. They didn't want to do it. We didn't want them to do it. They're not the good guys. I guess we always knew it. You know, they always knew it. They were so slap happy sometimes. They seemed so rad. And there were times, dear, you know, they were so bad. They made us cry. So we didn't want to do it. We didn't want to do it. We need some of that. True, yes, we do. Deed, we do. Yeah, no, we do. Give us, give us, give us, give us what we cry for. We need the brand of revelation, revolution that we would die for. You know, they made us love them. You know, they made us love you. Thank you very much, James. And with that, that concludes our open mic. Thank you all. Thank you to all you amazing people for participating. I appreciate it very much. And thanks to everyone who's coming to listen. Um, I can't remember the last time I even saw in the news or in like any uh, email or newsletter, John Mulroney having a full feature to himself. So this is exciting to me. Um, for, for those of you who don't know who he is, uh, you would, you might, you might remember him as the man behind the camera in many of the Boston Poetry Marathon and all its related events. The Boston Poetry Marathon has uh, gone through many changes and many, it's particularly name changes, but John has been one of the constants behind the camera being a recorder, a documenter, and thankfully a participant as well. I think it was during the National, uh, the Boston Poetry Massacre, I think is what it was called back in 2003. I believe that's when I first heard um, John Mulroney's uh, poem that made that uh, all catchy saying in the Boston MBTA, if you see something, say something, a poem that I'll always remember and always be impressed with. Uh, and he's never rested on his laurels since. He's continuing to work. He's been a musician, a filmmaker, but he wrote some decent boilerplate to get his introduction forth. So I won't ramble too much longer. I'll just get to the boilerplate and then you can, then more importantly, I'll shut up and you can hear him. John Mulrooney is a poet, filmmaker, and musician living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He is the author of If You See Something, Say Something from the Anchorite Press, and, and he is also the co-producer of the documentary The Peacemaker 
from Central Square Films. He serves as poetry editor for Vogue City, and he records and performs regularly with a number of musical groups in the greater Boston area. He serves as associate professor in the English department at Bridgewater State University. His work is also in Fulcrum, um, Press Wafer, Old Cuisine, Solstice, The Battersea Review, Poetry Northeast, Spoke, and Let the Bucket Down, as well as, as they say, many, many more. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to put your hands together 30, 40 times and give it up for Mr. John Mulroney. And also please mute your phones. Thank Virtual you so phone. much. Thank you so much, Chad. Uh, he makes good boilerplate. Can everyone hear me? Yes, I can uh, hear you. Good, okay. Uh, he makes good boilerplate. That's one of the nicest things anyone's ever said about me. All right. Um, oh, I gotta make sure that my, since I'm gonna be working off of my computer, make sure that it's still engaged. Uh, Stone Soup. And what Chad has done by carrying uh, you know, not, he's not just carrying the torch over, he's doing the work of, of keeping it going. It's been the first reading of so many people that have come through Boston and the, some of their first engagement with poetry. Uh, you know, I, I, I think of, you know, when I first went there, Jim, I see Jim Dunn's here, probably before I met you, um, meeting Jack Powers, and I associate that with the time, the, the, the brief times, a couple of times I met John Wieners, you know, and, and I think one with, was with Jim Burley, uh, you know, he'd just gone over and knocked on Wiener's door, um, <laughs> like he does, right? And, uh, yes. and, you know, it was like, I think maybe it was a Monday, I think, and it was a Monday at um, Green Street, right? Or it was Charlie's Tap, right? Before it was even at TT's. And um, we went over there and, and, and that's also the night I met Jack Powers. He was like, oh, John Wieners, I know him, right? And that, that happened on the same day. Uh, I thought I'd open with a, a, a poem by John. Um, Billy. He was a god, stepped out of eternal dream along the boardwalk. He looked at my girl, a dream to herself, and that was the end of them. They disappeared beside the sea at Revere Beach as I ain't seen them since. If you find anyone answering their description, please let me know. I need them to carry the weight of my life. The old gods are gone. What lives on in my heart is their flesh, like a wound, a tomb, a bomb. A poem after solstice for John Wieners. A storm is a rhetorical device, a retrieval of lost syllables. Rain foils the foliage to be, and it's got something up my sleeve. The year I was born, a god sauntered down the boardwalk on Revere Beach and stole your girl with his stare. I retained nothing I stared at that year or the next, although it's likely most of what I did was stare an impregnable embrace of the world that those around me probably called wonder, the first propriety squandered. And um, happy St. Patrick's Day, Slancha. I have a couple of poems here that have a, um, uh, well, this is, this is, uh, as some Irish content. This is, my friend wonders why Irish poets write about swans. And it's for the Irish poets. Michael Longley has one swan in front of him and one swan in his mind. Rachel saw swans today at Fresh Pond while I stayed in bed and read about Dolores Martinez who lives in the outskirts of White Swan and keeps her firearms ready. I played hooky with my mom and rode a swan boat in the public garden peddled by a kid from the neighborhood who worked for tips. The chipped paint off the swan's wing crumbled under my foot and stuck to the sole of my sneaker all the way down Boylston. 
Kieran Carson remembers a swan skeleton that was mistaken for a man by forensic police, the ribcage and clavicle so human. They had a suspect and presumed victim who'd been missing for weeks until an archeologist was called to set them straight. And the bones of the myth devoured the imagined murder. The smile of the swan and the black swan Chardonnay menaced me in the steakhouse and knew I would never be a chef. The black swan at the Escorial knew I would marry a great cook. I was told by the person I then cooked for that the swan pond was always beneath the window of the teacher's lounge so that the priests could cast a watchful eye on children who were about to get an object lesson that beauty is dangerous. A child's femur snapped in a beak, recalled while the wine was poured for a meal I had prepared of fresh rabbit and fingerling potatoes. Maeve McGuckian saw swans in a place called Princess Alexandra Gardens and said, these are not my swans. I have no rights to these swans. The swans of Randolph Holbrook made a nest atop an abandoned dock post in a swamp stream oozing out of New England vegetation, green and brown, but flashes of autumn fire in the October twilight that's just ahead of us, here, now, the place where I imagined the next swan to be, but it is no more. Those swans are gone, flown from the world, and the world of all real swans collapses and the armies of imagined swans amass in the leeward shore and charge snapping the femurs of real swans, smashing wine bottles and sinking swan boats into murky locks, rising there as haunted homicides seeking justice or just audience desiring to not be suspended in the heights of the imagined, but to make one ache real, a changeling with the ache that reconciles all things the delighted eye sees and all things the closed eye makes. I realized while I was reading that that has there's a, a rib cage reference here. I'm actually working with a couple of cracked ribs, uh, and I'm I'm I a little bit of trouble with my left hand here. I uh, I don't know if any of you are cyclists, but I, I got doored the other day. I got I got I got doored good on Mass Ave. Um, uh, this uh, home also. Uh, I don't know if it takes place anywhere, but there is uh, some Ireland in it. Uh, a gnome hog uh, is, well, it will become evident that I don't know what a gnome hog is, right? So, um, but they're, they're ships and maybe they are also um, uh, gods. Um, Pareidolia, which is when we see things in shapes, people in shapes, Pareidolia. Faces in the hedgerows appear in the late dusk. The muddy green darkens, reveals fluid smiles. Placid anguishes quivers the faces, hardly faces. The light lighting out, a question unanswered. A darkness revealed, the, the ruddy face of darkness fading to the nothing burger of darkness. Darkness beneath the dusk above the wreckage of a pickup truck at the mouth of the abandoned village and its wreckage that has graduated to ruin blank pedestals covered in lichens and moss, the gnome hogs absent, smashed with missionary zeal as far as we can discern. A face in darkness is itself darkness soon enough. A mouse in a humane trap makes little plastic sounds in a dusk that reveals this day like any other, slipping into a different like any other, a like any other you thought you knew the day you took a different mouse humanely to the landfill as a benevolent god. The slate blue clouds, a panther with a third eye, a tray of figs and lemons, a nest of cobalt eggs or ritual stones, a copse of trees ready to burst, an explosion of starlings seen from the shore that mimic the quick motion of steam up from the sink that obfuscate the hedgerows disappearing in the dusk before both are forgotten, a motion of matter departicularizing into the undiscernible, a smashing of idols, a filtering out of photons, a Heraclitan stream of one shape saying no, and then many shapes saying no, 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 a day in which the shape of another day fits perfectly like a you-sized disguise of you, your own face covered by this face, alike any other you know but haven't seen, like the faces in the hedgerows you can no longer discern. 
a blank like any other, like the day we went to that store in the thawing snow, but that store was closed. The shafts of sunlight finding their way beneath the bridge, the highway that spanned the river, astonished the roofs and gutters. The whole day was revealed as the day that other days had only been the placeholder for, so that even when we went back into the light and the familiar territory, it was new, a familiarity that had not happened before. Gnome hog means ship or God, or maybe ship and God, or maybe Godship, a magic that crosses water. No one knows that, or even if they guarded the abandoned village in the time before it was abandoned, but at least there are songs about it, songs of smashed idols that might just have been cracked cars or just abandoned ships that sing, I was from where I was from until I was from somewhere else. I used to wear a smock that was ever renewed and came through near the wreckage, came through the near wreckage, near came through the wreckage, came near through the wreckage. It was all, and it was all around me, the unseasonable around me, the music, it was all, and it was all without measure, and it was all occasionally it made you feel empathy for a creature perceived to be weaker than oneself, a creature nearly come through the wreckage, but the wreckage meant it could not be measured. The music, the mouse in the humane trap, who is the same mouse who was in the humane trap before but looks different each time, or is a different mouse who looks the same each time, like the school shooter just now, who looks like the school shooter then, the face that will stay, wanting to not stay, a shape that says no, 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 forever in a Heraclitean stream of bullets. He looks like the last like any other you would see before becoming the like any other you never thought you'd be. If you don't take a mouse over a body of water or over a major highway, it will return home, as it were, to what you call your home or wherever you have not abandoned yet. And so you really have been taking the same mouse to the abandoned landfill if you won't cross the water in the ship of whatever god you wish to be. The doctor can't comment on the ages of the victims or the prognosis of the wounded. The plain answerable questions put on dumb show to keep us from the unanswerable, how it is that someday wreckage graduates to ruin. The arms of the woman gesticulating on the playground obscure her face, hands open and close like birds trapped in hedgerows, reach out to touch the human form, not fully in the frame that cannot be discerned, seeking a shape that will say, Yes. Answerable. Um, and um, this next poem um, is, um, I think, I believe this poem is, is for Kevin Gallagher, if anyone knows Kevin Gallagher who um, has a book called Loom that uh, informs, you know, I was helping him actually film some of the uh, readings of these, of the poems from here. And it's also a lot about what's going on uh, last summer. There's lots of people in this poem. There's a lot of plagiarism in this poem. You may know some of the folks that I'm plagiarizing. Um, and um, yeah, all the people are real. Some of them have statues, some of them don't. Maybe some of the ones who do shouldn't. Maybe some of the ones who or don't should. Um, under Parker's statue. In the confessional, the slots break shafts of light coming through, you hope from above. Disembodied heads float in the patchwork darkness and light that descends to an even darker floor. Bless me, bless you. Did I sin? No, I sneezed. A voice says to seek light from within. Tonight, no blackout. The sins of one dream streak across the common and shine upon the hill. Flashes of blue like angry phosphorus in the Fort Point Channel. Graffiti girds the swamp angel's backsides and the windows on Boylston shatter like tempest waves raging in the tide. In the confessional, catharsis was leather bound and cushioned. The secrets revealed the pains and pangs of quiet desperation were presumed to calm. In the confessional, confess that all the morning doves gather on the roof of the house next door and seem unaffected by the helicopters, that the guidebook sustained you more than books on aesthetics and train timetables more than both. Stephen Jonas lived at 91 Revere Street. Being of unsure mind and shaky morals, he betook himself to be first a butterfly, 
than something approaching a hot dog. But in your family, it was all about the pantomime, partaking yourselves as once you might attack the lords of the loom and the lash with equal vigor, Fred Burke providing land that had been Camp Miggs for the 54th reenactors to drill on. In the confessional, confess you coveted Sakimuni and Vanzetti's Bamiyan stare and cop their faces on the orange line for the ride to Skippy White's where you could disappear, be one with your brothers who wish to be among the invisible. In the confessional, confess that you let a perfectly good plague of frogs go to waste and that Theodore Parker's statue spoke to you first in dreams and then the voice in the back of your head you heard on Center Street and that you knew then you should never tell and that you knew it was a sin to not remember what he told you, the blank space into which you woke suddenly, the warm rush of the supernatural somehow becoming home in me. Is that me or is that you? This poem is talking to the city, the city where Sako and Varakana take the hungry children to Joe and Nemo's for a supreme dog, the city where Sarah Parker Raymond was tossed out of the old Howard halfway through Don Pasquale before old Scully Square got old. The city where there is an East Boston, but only the desperate go there. The city where I am always descended from collaborators, and I know I can keep that sometimes hidden and sometimes held to my breast like a locket of grief, rib, rubbed with thumb and forefinger for all to see. Dublin-born Augustus St. Gauden makes the front page again, when Boston officials plead with protesters to respect our city. A city that doesn't see its statues walk the streets unmoored from pedestals, but they do but they do, that does not see itself, that does not see we are the measure, and as the measure, we are the models. We cannot take the measure of what we cannot conceive. We cannot honor the memory of what we haven't done, and what we cannot measure can only find its way into a flash bomb, a stun grenade, a long-range acoustic device that crams a song we cannot hear into our throats. At the mouth of the public garden, three men sprawled in filth, theirs, ours, the social contract, a topographical map of hardships now flown far away beyond their eyes, shut to all but opiate oblivion, they lie like O'Sullivan's harvest of death. Their sleeping bags and shopping carts, the bedrolls and ammo wagons that littered battlefields from Gettysburg to Fort Wagner. They don't recall last night the regiments that marched to see if Charles Eliot lied when he wrote, undying proof is what the soldier's sacrifice provides. And if pride, courage, devotion, make lives that matter. In the confessional, the shafts of light like the moon seen from underwater, the priest's submerged baritone offers absolution and an alibi, one substance transformed to another in the burning and the unburning, and the burning and the unburning, the Ashavahista promised revelation, but Father Rosenthal says you are honor bound not to reveal what cannot be removed, but will abide forever. I would never tell what Parker said. Tell him you are a plagiarist. I tell him I am a plagiarist. He says, you didn't just say that. Tell him there is a pit with a nest of white creatures. I don't care if this poem gets graffitied right all over this poem. Replace each word with each word. I am ready for this world and so can welcome a valley full of empty mouths that deafen. Please light this poem on fire and throw it in the cavern of sorrows beneath Bunker Hill, wherein we stash our squash colored buses, where Louise de Hicks's roar still reaches the cable stays of the Zakem Bridge. Light this poem on fire and let it light the lost half mile. Light this poem and rub its ashes into your flesh, into your mouth, the taste of it, a trace of metal, of blood and sorrow, of the tongue that's tied, and when it's tied is the tongue that tells you all you know. And um, I think I have one or two more here. Um, this is a newish, um, I'm calling it at the moment. All conjunctions aspire to greatness. Across the marsh, twilight fades, night sky gazing back at your gaze with a wink that promises an even greater conjunction than you had imagined. The industrial park squanders a few shimmers on cantilevered windows, and there are fewer of us now, which makes the stars seem greater in number, harder to count. But Saturn startles us, and then we almost recall when we knew to ask, aren't we the gods who can know the particular confirms the general? This beauty in the sky makes all skies beautiful. 
who can know that it is necessary. There are those who fall into the abyss just as it is necessary. There are those who reach into the abyss. We were waiting to find the way to cross that parking lot, learning to want to cross it like the first mariners did on shore, a wedge of geese like a ship in the sky. Almost no one on the bike path today. Now we truly move like ghosts. Ornette sings, friends and neighbors, that's where it's at. Friends and neighbors, that's where it's at. And he's right. The bodies shuffle in their wide berth, the dusk in winter indistinguishable from the dawn. A light always and elsewhere, an other we are born with, an absence, a missing that we cannot even see, that we cannot know, but how we know loss when first it kisses us and it dances around us, swirls and is the story of its swirling, sails around us and is the story of its sailing. And it says, hey sailor, don't you want to be startled enough to want to scrub seam and feel clean and give the missing an exact name? Gem Spa, once ballroom, the second Spanish Republic, Rena Miguel Christie, Tom Tullis, Brian Kelly, and not to be struggling to be overwhelmed 400,000 times when you really want to believe just once would do. And um, I, think, I, think I, have, I think I have time for one more. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Which is also in the, but it's in the longest, you know, it's one of these, I, I, I don't know, I, I can't make them short. Um, this is, uh, so entanglement is um, um, something else I don't know about. I write about a lot of things I don't know about. It's all, sometimes called spooky action uh, for physicists. It's the, um, it, it's, it's what we're, we're beginning to learn about black holes and about um, the way that particles can be affected in other parts of the universe, other locations. Um, and it thinks about particles a lot. Entanglement at solstice. In one city, light fades. The light is fading to reveal the darkness on the day that is the longest day. And it's your last chance to play the chess master who will beat you in the time it takes to divide an hour for the second time by 60 as Sumerians did, and so now, so do you, divide the hour into superior, highly composite numbers. And the tablet and the eye are two sides of a triangle. And the third side is the shape of a lightning bolt seen at dusk on the longest day, is the shape of Coltrane's tenor looming, lashing from the speakers, is the shape of a decision to take down the mobile of the girl before her mirror, the decision to become entangled in the last thing that was in the room before you moved in. 3D display faded with the sun, morning sun in that room, the face and the reflected face replicated on both sides, and strung out across the chopstick sized level plane like rabbits strung on a hunter's line. In one city, the mobile of the painting is thrown away, a print of which hung in the apartment in another city near where the original girl before her mirror hung. And that print then moved to another city near where the original girl before her mirror was painted a city in which the light shows us that we are the imperfect recollections of light shadows that show where light wished to be, but failed. On the longest day, the last light dapples the bare shoulders of the chess masters that cannot cling or wait to suss out the queen's whim in the time it takes to divide an hour for the second time by 60. And on the longest day, a girl wanders among the masters with the girl before her mirror on her t-shirt. The day you threw away a mobile, you failed to throw away before or were unable, but did in the time it takes to divide the hour for the second time by 60 of a painting you neither care for nor hate. And on that day, you can peel a yellow sticky from a compact disc with impressions, spiritual, Brasilia scrawled on it and something unreadable in a hand you recognize as your own, a hand no longer yours that made cuneiform on a slipshod yellow sticky. Brasilia is a fake capital. Brazier's a famous doll. Brothers, Jerusalem is ours. Or was that an artificial capital stuffed into an envelope containing a goodbye note that was carried from a city that was increment to a city that was avalanche in a folder of postcards, New Orleans, Cairo, Caravaca, where I was once the marquee, and a picture of you, who are always making something out of nothing with the writer of a different goodbye note and a picture of Sonny Chirac and Alice Coltrane. 
You can peel a yellow sticky off a CD. The particles of glue cascade in the air like tufts of incense from a thurible. The particles of glue, the visible and the invisible too, the smallest particles, smaller than the bit depth of the songs, impressions, spiritual, Brasilia, first assembled at the village vanguard as particles of sound in a different increment of the city where they reassembled on a CD when John Coltrane loomed and lashed from the speakers in the apartment where the print of Girl Before Her Mirror hung in this city. The chess masters pack up the plastic boards because it is getting dark. The longest day is over. The pieces hard to distinguish. Each unrepeatable set of human foibles become the seeming same. No longer parts of a whole, their movement unintelligible, their action spooky. The girl with the girl before her mirror on her shirt disintegrating in the parting light. The particles of which are like so much of your own life, scrawled into something unreadable, and a hand you recognize is no longer yours. The hand of a person who could not answer why you cling to this and not to that, or why we divide the hour into 60, and then again for a second time, and not another number, and then again for a second time, or why this city on the longest day, cracked by perfect lightning, lets you throw away and crumble the glue that entangled you, both close up and at a distance. And uh, it's really wonderful to, to share some work with you folks. Just really thank, thank you, Chad. Thanks everybody. It was wonderful to hear everybody. Um, thanks very much. Thank you, John. Give your applause and praise as much as you can virtually. That was uh, fantastic. And I'm so glad that we got this captured for posterity because for all your selfless recording of uh, all the past Boston poetry events and all their incarnation, incarnations and all their names, I don't think we've you know, heard enough of your, your work. And I do, uh, well, my God, you, you, you're, just, you're barely a week away from recovering from a, uh, cr from cracked or, and or broken ribs from a uh, bike. I don't know, they're, they're somewhere between cracked and bruised. Uh, you know, um, I, was, I was more, um, um, it, it, it was, it was, it was more that the guy in the car who doored me, like got out and almost attacked me. I'm like, I'm like I, he was claiming I did something to his car. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was like, uh, and, and I have video and like, I'm, I'm videoing him on my phone and he's sort of coming at me and I'm like, you know that that's probably not a good idea. Right. Wow. Um, you've seen YouTube, haven't you? Um, <laughs> oh my God. But, um, but yeah, no, it's, 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 uh, it's getting, all my movements are back. M I'm more, I was more worried about the hand and playing guitar and stuff like, but. Um, well, all the more respect for you for coming out and doing this tonight. You know, coming, out. coming out. Coming out from the comfort <laughs> of your room. It's, uh, yeah. that's, that's, it's just a feat. So that's pretty fantastic. And thank you very much. And uh, we do encourage people to uh, make donations. So if you do have any Venmo or PayPal, we would love to uh, have you share those in the chat, and I can share those with the uh, with the rest of the group. We've done oh. with uh, Tim Gager and a host of other poets uh, as of late to uh, just offset the uh, just to, just to give you something for the labors. <laughs> God, I think I have a Venmo somewhere, but I don't even know what it is. Like if I if if, if I if I gave it out, it might be the wrong one. You know, you'd, you'd be sending money into someone else's Venmo. Um, <laughs> Well, if you want to text it to me, uh, then we can share it for later. But um, uh, we definitely want to do give you a little something to uh, show our gratitude. So uh, please do so. I'll be posting uh, hopefully at least one or two still shots from this, from this, and the as well as the entire video for uh, for this you reading. Can, you, can, you can take the money and spend it on Photoshop then, and make <laughs> me look a li make me look a little better. <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, again, thank you very much, John. And uh, when, when's the next big, when's the next big collection coming out? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, if there's any uh, publishers out there, if you know of any, get on it, because that, because this would be a fantastic thing to see more of this work out there in the public. And when's the next Book City coming out? I know you, I know you have an online presence now, but I was wondering if there was any uh, plans for a print journal now that, although I know that, um, 
that might be difficult with the current circumstance. Yeah, I think I think actually since we've sort of got a handle on on the online version, it's, it's probably going to stay online for a while. And there's a uh, it will be a new issue coming out. We hope it's going to go live early next week, which will have a a section um, dedicated to Lewis Warsh, right? Who we who we lost uh, this year early last year i don't know i don't know time anymore um but the poet lewis warsh uh, we have uh, uh we're going to be f uh, featuring uh, a lot of his work um and uh and i think it's gonna it's gonna remain online because it's sort of it's kind of ironed out like some of the some of the parts that some of those some of those nooks and crannies of you know i think it's really hard to do both right and those those of you who are uh, publishes now right that, you know that if it's it's um it's a very hard thing to do i i can understand that and we're glad you're keeping a presence we're glad to keep it ongoing and maybe we'll see each other at the next boston poetry marathon maybe we won't hopefully we'll see, we'll see each other in person yeah, that would be <laughs> that's, great. that's the thing awesome. it's really uh be yeah fantastic I, I don't feel comfortable having it 100 percent uh you know having a having a gathering live now and hopefully by the summer uh, we can get that yeah. going uh, it'll be soon, we hope. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, thank you very much, John. And uh, thanks. Well, thank you all. Thanks. Thanks to all of you for uh, coming tonight. Uh, come back next week for uh, Jason Wright's feature as he um, does a sequel to his to his uh, book, Train of Thought. And at the end, we have uh, at, at the end of the month, we have Colleen Houlihan. And then on uh, April seventh, we have. Uh, we have uh, John Roche, a New York based, upstate New York based poet who has been uh, publishing, uh, who's been publishing for, for many years and writing his own books. He has a new book out from Foothills Publishing. And he's a perfect choice. He's been very busy the, uh, during the Trump era uh, producing a series of anthologies uh, and part, part of a series called Survival. So I, so I highly recommend you look at the links I posted on his, uh, on his uh, Stone Soup page on stonesouppoetry.blogspot.com. You can check out his work in a number of places online, including Oddball Magazine for in recent years. So I hope you, um, I hope you do that and I hope you um, stay tuned for more news. I'm hoping to have some more announcements for who's gonna be closing out in April and I'm gonna be on the phone with people to figure out how we can have a uh, a different stone soup experience for May 1st, even if, if it's not gonna be a live one. And my, my biggest fantasy is I had like running out of theater, but that ain't gonna happen, but we're gonna try and do something very special and I want you all to be part of it. And with that, um, thank you again, John. We do the obligatory wave goodbye. I have most people trained, they're doing the wave even before I announced it. That's amazing. Ed, Ed, Ed Galt right. disdains, he, he always right. disdains, but... Um, <laughs> But um, thank you guys very much. And it can be like this every week, people. All we need is you. Stay tuned. The best is yet to come. Stay tuned for this video to be uh, to air uh, on YouTube sometime tomorrow between 8 and 9. And stay tuned for more announcements to come up on stonesouppoetry.blogspot.com, the Stone Soup website, my own website, chatparentopoetforhire.com, and wherever I, can, uh, wherever I can annoy you, Twitter, Facebook, wherever. Follow uh, John Mulroney on Twitter. Follow him on, uh, friend him on Facebook. And thank you guys very much. The show's over. See you next time. Thank you very much, Chad. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.